Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us once again. Good to see um, some familiar faces. I am joined by two guests today. So the first one is Mr. Anthony Melchiori, who of course is a hospitality executive and expert. Anthony, hello. Hello, how, are, how is everyone? <laughs> and then also Dr. Sherry Woosley, who um, is a very smart lady who is going to help us understand the art of serving students today. Hello, ma'am. Hello. <clears throat> so I want to dive into our roadmap today. We're going to talk about hidden at-risk students, but you know, I try to, I try to keep it lively. So I have to tell you, Anthony, that I'm afraid you've ruined my daughter. This is her. Um, Hold on, you're on, you're on mute. I said, okay. now I've ruined three of my daughters, now I've ruined your daughter. That's okay, well, that's fair enough. So this sweet child loves Hotel Impossible, watches it all the time. I, this is my first day back from vacation. I got to go somewhere. Oh, where'd you go? I went south of Austin, so a resort south of Austin. Okay. They did a great job. But I will tell you that going on vacation with this child, now that she's an aficionado on Hotel Impossible, is a different experience. She, because, teaches, she teaches you how to inspect the room? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So she inspected the entire room. She was very happy with it until she got to the balcony and she's like, no, they need to power wash. There's, this, is not, this is not clean. And I was like, I'm sorry. And then she does things like um, <clears throat> she wanted some cucumber in some of her water. And so she Ooh, requested it. You, yeah. were the you were the fancy hotel. I was. And she requested it at the restaurant. Um, and when the woman said, yes, I'll bring it right out. And my daughter, Lillian, was like, she was so delighted. She loves her job. She was so delighted to bring me water with you. So it's like a completely different experience now. Because I'm like paying attention to all this stuff. So thank you for that. No, it's, 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 <laughs> it's an honor. And it's, it's a privilege. And um, I... Wow, that's, that's it's fantastic. awesome. Yeah. So, are your kids like that? Like, when you go to a hotel, are they like? Um, no, not at all. That's because you're there. I, my daughters barely know what I do for a living. <laughs> <laughs> the well, only time I get props is when their boyfriend or their friend say, "Hey, you know, they my friend saw you on you know show or whatever," and you can see that little pride creep in, and they're like, oh, my dad's on TV. That's my dad. But they, yeah. they barely, they barely, you know, let's put it this way. Their rooms and bathroom look nothing like it they should. Yeah, yeah, that's fair enough. So I have one other thing that um, <clears throat> I need to you show you. Me another picture? Or no, no, no. I pro Listen, I'm not embarrassing you this time. <laughs> so this is a picture that my daughter has been on me to show you, because this is a real billboard in our town. Interesting. Okay, what was your daughter's take? So she is like, they are not talking about how they're caring for people, how they're hospi uh, hospitable, why we should actually stay there. What they're saying is just, hey, we need some money. Can you please come stay here two times, right? So she's kind of mortified about it. And she would like to hear your response to this billboard. This is how I feel about it. We're talking about it, right? True. Okay. So other people are talking about it. And right now, people are desperate. You know, one of the things as your daughter gets older, she'll understand when, you know, she's no longer on your payroll, that <laughs> she's got to pay her own bills. And they're like, I just did a speech yesterday that we're sending it on to Congress about the dangers of not supporting our industry. Yeah. And so, so on one hand, I really am delighted by it. On the other hand, I'm like, mm. so, <laughs> so um, I kind of like it simply because if I was driving through town and I needed a hotel room and I was going to stay at a Holiday Inn Express and I saw that sign, I would go online, I would look at the reviews, and if those rooms were clean and they got good reviews, I would go in and say, hey, I heard you needed the money. Nice. So, so, so I am a little bit right now very sensitive because people are losing their livelihood. Yeah. And so so they so did maybe tongue in cheek, but I kind of like the fact that your daughter talked about it, that we're talking about it. So listen, right now you got to get attention. And if there's brands in the industry, in her community, in this hotel's community, this is a way to stand out. And, you know, like I said, I, I would probably go out of my way to stay there. To go and see what's going on. And I think that's a really good point, right? Like, it's about context. 
So being able to say like, hey, right now that's actually true. Like pick a small independent hotel or a small independent school because it is true that we're right. in a really difficult Six months ago, I'm turned off by that sign. Because then yeah, saying, right. you don't know how to run your business. It's been 10 years of growth. You don't know what you're doing. I have no, I, I don't, I don't care. Yeah. But, but it's not that. And I would guarantee you, if you go online and look at the reviews, they have good reviews. All right. We're going to have to go check it out. Well, you're, well you're, you're talking. I will check it out. Okay. Sounds good. What town so, is it? In? Uh, Abilene, A-B-I-L-E-N-E, -E, Texas. <clears throat> so I will be very interested to hear if they're okay. doing a good job. I, I'm going to bet you nine out of ten dollars it has good reviews. Okay. All right. It's doing good. And the reviews are 4.0, 306 reviews, and very clean, service oriented. The last several reviews, a place of rest, a good value. We will be back. Great overnight hotel. Nice. Nice, nice place. And you know why I know that they're well run? Because that sign tells me that they're well run. Um, yeah. Because, because they, they're trying to be creative. The sign isn't probably cheap to get. Um, their logo, it, it's like it's well done. It's like I see it, I read it. It's well done. And anybody that can put that sign together, that marketing idea together, they're running the hotel the right way. Nice. So the sad thing is this means you're not going to be coming to Abilene to fix this hotel because it's doing well. Um, yes. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Um, I, I did, I did six hours of shooting yesterday and I haven't really shot for six hours in yeah. quite a while. And I got to, I got to build that muscle again because man, by the end of the day, I was wiped out. Yeah. I saw your video that you posted, but the ballroom looked gorgeous. So well, it is gorgeous, but it's empty. Yeah. That's a problem. So we'll, you'll start seeing more content on that. And like I said, we, I was asked by the biggest lobbyist group in the country for hospitality, AHOA, to do a video that they're going to send to the Congress. And uh, so we, we, we did a pretty intense video yesterday, which I'll be posting about little by little. Yeah, that's great. Well, you'll be happy to know that most of our um, participants like the sign they say similar to what you do, which is like, hey, that's creative. I think I do some research and decide to go there. So that's good. Okay, so let me do the State of the Union because it is way different than when we started. Let's talk about what's happening on campus. And then I wanna talk about how we're gonna find at-risk students. Um, first, let's remember that when we talked the first time, it was June 16th, we had 65% of our schools planning to go for in-person. <clears throat> the next time we talked, I think it was down to, 60%. Last time we talked, it was at 49. And then the Chronicle has changed the way that they're doing um, the numbers, which I think we're all used to because it seems like that's, that happens a lot with COVID. But right now we're at 23.5% of schools are planning to go in person, either fully in person or primarily in person. And then you can see some of those other um, pieces. So what I'm curious about, if it's not primarily in person, if it's not full online, if it's not all the other things, what's other? Are they going to be on a spaceship? I don't know. Both other and to be determined really troubles me because I'm not sure what those mean. Well, Governor Cuomo yesterday in New York said uh, by this Friday, they have to have all the plans for the districts in. And there's 118 districts in New York City, in, in, mm -hmm. in not New York City, but New York State, that don't have their plan in. Wow. And he was like, how do you not have your plan in? Right. And he goes, if you're not in by Friday, you can't open because we need two or three weeks before we open to look at your plan and approve your plan. Wow. So we ask um, our attendees, when is the first day of classes? So we have not, none of our attendees' the first day of class this week. 25% of them start the week of August 17th. So that's the next week. 50% of them start the week of August 24th and then 25% of them start August 31st. But I'm saying like, it's here. Like we, we are on it all of a sudden. Um, which is so crazy. Listen, listen, people are still arguing whether they should wear a mask or not. I know. I know. Well, you remember when we talked last week, we were like, how many of you know the plan? And it was only 50% of our attendees knew what the plan for reopening was. So here we are two weeks later, we're in a really similar place. Also, I think it's really interesting to look at this by private versus public. So here you can see a public four-year institution. 
um, their kind of where they're primarily in person is much lower than our private. So private institutions, um, they just, I mean, similar to the hotel we're talking about, they're just in a position where they have to, in order to be fiscally solvent, they have to open in person, which makes it even more important for them to have a good plan. Yeah, I just put two of my daughters, or oh, actually one on Sunday uh, at Iona College, she, she went, she's staying in her house. We've went to the house for her the last couple of years with her friends. And my other daughter is getting ready to pack her bag to go to Manhattanville. And my other daughter is, um, we're getting her, ba the basement ready for her to work from home because she's graduating college. She's graduating early. And they, they're not doing it in person, so she'll be graduating online, which is- So she'll, is she graduating in December then? She, yeah, she's graduating early. She's wow. graduating too much early. Yeah, it's lot, Sherry and I were talking just about our kids, I mean, little kids, trying to figure out what are we gonna do and how are we gonna keep a mask on them? And um, it my, looks- I'm sorry. Ahead. No, no, go ahead. My wife's a pre-K teacher and she can retire anytime she wants. And I was like, not saying you should, I, I, I don't want you to retire because you're not ready, but on the other hand, like I've never said, like I'm not, like my wife is the wrong person, do whatever you want. But if she decides to go, like if they say she has to go to school, we're gonna have a serious conversation. Because yeah. my wife's been very, very nervous about this whole thing. And she has pre-K. How do you keep 18 pre-K kids with That's their right. And socially distanced and washing their hands all the time. No, it can't happen. Yeah, I don't know that that's gonna happen. Um, okay, attendees say that, <clears throat> let's see, 55% of them, their schools are planning on opening hybrid. 18% um, of them online, 18% of them in person. And then one of them said other. And so whoever said other, tell me what that means. Because we are really curious about what are the other choices? If we're not going to be together or if we're not going to be online, what does other mean to you? Um, Anthony. I'm thinking of a number between one and a hundred. 27. 27. 27. It's amazing. Look, Matt, Matt wrote it down for me. Oh, are you serious? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Did you think I was lying? <laughs> are you serious? <laughs> yes. You won. This is a I game you play in your family, right? How did we do that? <laughs> Matt, did we, did we have some kind of mind trick that you played on me or I played on you? No, we just, you know, we like you, Anthony. We're, we're simpatico. We, we, wow. we know. We know what's happening. Wow. Okay. Okay. So let me talk about our Ferris tools. For those of you who are Ferris clients, we've been building a lot of stuff for you. I'm not going to spend very much time on this, but I do, as we're thinking about at-risk students, Please remember that we've built into your system all of your COVID forms, so how we're going to identify students who have symptoms, either self or somebody else saying this. Also, your check-in forms so that you can do good reporting on all of your cases. We also have statuses so you can keep track of what's happening with each of those cases and how they got um, either COVID or what symptoms you're uh, reporting there. And then also we have email templates so that you can really easily tell faculty the student's gonna be out of class, student you can't come to class, we're starting quarantine. Um, I will put a link to all of our tools here and then also at the end. But if you have questions about how to use 360 for COVID, um, I mean, that is an, a hidden at-risk population because we just don't know what's gonna happen when we all come together in the fall. Um, and so using technology to really facilitate that is gonna be, um, super important. I would also just say, um, please remember that what our students want from us, whether they're online or they're not online, is they want a valuable education, they want a connected community, they want to be able to have experiences, and I know that you have to be open in order to be um, financially solvent, but I also know that this is continually changing. It's very hard to know where we're gonna end up. And so just don't forget your um, value proposition for I what. I think the number one value proposition should be everyone should have fun. And then everything else should be below that. And so I see some creative way principals are telling kids or, or, or presidents of colleges are telling their students how they're gonna come together, how they're gonna do this. They're either doing a rap song or they're doing a disco song or. Yeah 
or they're, they're, they're being funny, they're doing a stand-up routine that's very appropriate. And I think what I've learned by watching that uh, on my half hour a day uh, TikTok addiction, um, the, um, that that's what we have to remember. We have to remember to make this fun and to make this interesting because we're all freaking out. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I just saw a parody of Don't Touch, Can't Touch That. Um, that was a principle. Oh yeah, maybe that's one of the ones I saw. That was so Yeah, funny. it was really good. They did a great job of this is what it means when we're all going to be back together. So uh, Doctor, am I going to have to be, uh, like, are you going to show me those um, paintings on your wall? Am I going to have to figure out what those dots mean or no? It's going to be a Rorschach test for you, Anthony. That's what I was trying to <laughs> oh, sure yeah, I'm, just all. Showing, I'm just showing you, though, if you do that to me, you're in trouble because it's going to be <laughs> yeah, like, no, not I my never, style. I'm we're fine. Anything. <laughs> Sherry is a painter also, so whenever we get to talk to her, we get to see some of her artwork. Whatever's by. drying behind me, right? Yeah, that's great. Right. <laughs> I love it. Um, hey, so I heard this quote the other day, and I want for us to talk about it because I think it is, um, it actually settled me a little bit <clears throat> to think about, we just haven't deciphered the chaos we're in quite yet, but we will. And I was thinking about this idea that our experiences provide meaning for us. So the anxiety that we have right now about school opening is that we haven't done it before, we have new processes, we're trying to figure out how to make it all work. And that slowly as we walk through the experiences, it's gonna come together. We're gonna decipher what it means, we're gonna understand the places where we need to invest and the places where we're doing a great job. So I really love this quote, and it made it made me think about this hotel. Anthony, do you recognize it? It is. I'm going to say it is in Florida. <clears throat> it is in Florida. There were uh, two brothers that ran it together. No. Okay, this hold is... on, hold on, hold on. Oh, it's the one with the gentleman that had a handicap. He was blind. No. You've okay. done so many hotels. Is it the one in Orlando with the lady that didn't know anything? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. I just love that summary. I want you, when you start doing Hotel Impossible again, if you could just write the summaries for the episode. It's like season six, episode three in Orlando with the woman who doesn't know. Well, actually, we do every Thursday. We started this the third week. We're doing um, a breakdown of Hotel Impossible on my Facebook Live. So awesome. three o'clock Facebook Live, if you're interested, we do a breakdown of every show. Matter of fact, guess what show we're breaking down tomorrow? What? Third? Which one? This show. Really? Yep. I'm telling you, I feel like we, are we related somehow? I think we are. I mean, we don't talk beforehand at all. No, I, hey, I got on early today. I got on at, at what? At, at 258? 6.30. You, yeah, you woke Matt up with your texts. You were like, hey. Oh, that was this morning. Yeah, but, but then I came on two minutes before. Oh, yeah, that's true. That is true. <clears throat> okay, so I want to talk about this hotel because I want to talk about chaos disorder not quite um, deciphered. This hotel, what I appreciate about it is that Anthony walked around and he was like, you know, as you do, you're like trying to understand what are the foundational problems and what's going on here. So you're just kind of, <laughs> you're just kind of walking before around. Before you go forward. Look at that picture and explain that picture to me. Okay, so this is you. You've just gotten to the hotel. You're walking up the um, stairwell. What is the picture? If you saw the picture and you didn't know anything about Hotel Impossible, you didn't know anything, what does that picture tell you? I mean, are you talking about your perfect pocket square? What I'm talking about is you just said it, right? You said <laughs> chaos. What was the quote? Undeciphered, chaos? yeah. Right. That's right. So I'm in the middle of chaos. But when you look at me, it's like I when I first did the show, I was like, do I go in with just kind of what I'm wearing now, like kind of just a nice shirt, nice pants and go in? Or do I look like a person that's running the Four Seasons Maui right. or the Four Seasons Hong Kong? So all this chaos, you know, they see the order in me. And so it was a very thoughtful way of approaching it. Like I really put a lot of thought um, into that outfit. It's 112 degrees in Orlando that day. And so I spent 108 shows worrying about my wardrobe and worrying about looking like that because everything was chaos. So if I look like chaos, then no one's going to take me seriously. If, I, if I'm telling you you need order and you look at me 
And you're like, how's this guy keep his not, how's he not sweat? And how's he have a pocket square that's perfect for 12 hours a day and four day shooting? And it's because I focus on it. Right. It's not an accident. Which, thank you, because I do appreciate the idea that we are coming into something new that we don't know how to make sense of, but we are in charge of ourselves and we can bring ourselves orderly, um, disciplined, uh, good at our jobs into chaos and help make meaning out of those things, right? That we don't have to be like swept by the fact that there's a lack of order or it's a hard process or we're learning a new thing. I'll let Sherry answer that one. <laughs> Well, I I do have to admit, like, as you all were talking, I was kind of, I don't know, struck by the contrast of that stairwell, the chaos, and the order of the outfit. Yeah. So I, I think you're right on on the choice of the outfit, but also as you look ahead to this fall, if we look chaotic, if we sound chaotic, the students are going to absolutely pick up on that let alone the parents. <laughs> and part of that is assurance, right? Yeah. So that when they see us, they feel assured, oh, these are people who are put together, they're thoughtful, they're doing what they need to be doing. I don't have to be anxious. You, you, you know, and it's not like when we grew up, it's like if the teachers and, and the people that we see in leadership roles don't have their stuff together, well, we're like, okay, they don't have their stuff together, but they're leaders, so let's, let's, let's give them a break. Right. There's no break now. Like my kids ain't giving you a break. Right. Like if you show up, if you show up and you're in charge, my kids will fall in line. They will That's fall right. in line and they will say, dad, I love my teacher. I love my print. I love my president. They had stuff together. They were tight. They, they didn't take any crap from anybody. And they were, they were really tight. If they're not, my daughters will take advantage of that in a second. True that. That's right. You got to show up and be, have it together because there isn't the same sort of like respect. You just respect authority. You just do. Right. right? This is, I always say, it's really funny because these students think they're real people where they're allowed to say like, I don't like that or that doesn't make sense to me or whatever, which is not how I think most of us were raised. They think that they're allowed to show up and say like, that's not a good plan. Yeah. I, got, I, thought, I thought I had something to say and then my mother gave me the scar in my head. <laughs> I realized I, said, I don't really have anything. You have to nothing say. to say. <laughs> I'll sit right here. <laughs> okay, whatever you want, yeah. Um, okay, so I want to go back to this hotel because I really, what I think is interesting about it, Anthony, oh. is that you walked around and you were like, there's something weird going on here where it's like the floors have this white stuff on it. And oh, I, don't really I found out later it's this white mold that is very um, abnormal to be in a hotel. Yeah. And so this thing of you like walking around and trying to make sense of what's happening, what is this stuff, why is there water damage everywhere? Right. And then you got into the hotel and it was like making sense of chaos was there's black mold in this hotel everywhere, <clears throat> like behind the walls, black mold everywhere. Right. 80% 80 of the hotel had black mold. And there were people staying there. Yeah. Do, do, are you going to tell everyone the most exciting part of the hotel? Well, what do you think the most exciting part the of the 250 hotel? pound nest of killer bees. There you yeah. go. I like it. Like, click right there. You and I are like so. Like, <laughs> so listen, what I think is crazy about this is there's black mold everywhere. 80% of the building, not to mention the killer bees, the bed bugs, and the feral cats that live in the hallway. Yeah. And my favorite part was the owner said, I didn't know. Right. Right. My favorite. Well, I really like when you're like, hey, how long has this hole in the ceiling been here? And she was like, oh, I mean, that's, you know, a couple days. Huh. We're not falling for that. Right. And, and, and you know that, and that's kind of a good point where if, if we treat ourselves, first of all, um, and we don't give ourselves the respect of this is a pandemic, this is stressful. We're asking kids to go to school. We're going to teach them online, but also in school, we're asking our professors to teach online and also maybe go to school. And um, well, this is stressful to put this together. Oh, and by the way, this is life and death. If we make a mistake, if we don't get a form from a kid that's COVID negative and for some reason he doesn't fill it in or COVID positive and he doesn't give us that form or we miss that form, someone may get really sick or may die. So the first thing is we've got to give ourselves a break to understand the stress that goes on in our head, in our body with that kind of decision-making process. That's right. 
And, and so as soon as you get serious with yourself and say, okay, this is like, this is everything. This is like the craziest position I'll ever be in in my life, hopefully. And okay, I got it. And I'm going to manage that. And I'm going to take it seriously. Then you can open up. Then you can kind of incorporate organization and fun. But you've got to give yourself a break to understand what your body's dealing with and what your mind's dealing with every day with the stress. So because a lot of people are pushing that down. I said it today on my show. I Every single person I have spoken to in the last two weeks, the first thing they start with me, and very successful people, man, my mind is playing tricks on me. I'm, I'm really freaking out a little bit. Yeah. It's like, I got to go do this, or I got to go eat Chinese food, or I got to go have ice cream, or I got to go work out, or, yeah. or I just got to take long walks on the beach for three hours. And, and so I think people got to um, start there. I think that's right. And I think, so what I want to point out about what you just said is, as I was thinking about this this morning, the hotel industry is ahead of the academic industry because you, as soon as COVID hit, everybody went home and then you guys had to start thinking about how can we make this safe? How can we bring people back? How can we do these things? So you, it's like almost like as soon as it, it hit, businesses were affected and you started the process of how do we fix this so that yeah, we but, but, to be fair, but to be fair is <clears throat> we shut down no money came in we have we could have money coming in tomorrow if we figure this out where school's like okay let's just shut down until right. we figure out what's happened then the chaos in the government and everybody and all the states so we're like you know what 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 shoe do we put on to like i don't know which way to go so we got to look at that you know that's we got to be fair because Again, I love my industry, but my industry is not usually the first people up at bat saying, hey, let's figure this out. We're yeah. usually, we're usually you know, last at saying, you know, let's figure it out. But I do think that you, so um, academics had lead time because we had March. I mean, we didn't do great from March until May, but then we've had the summer to do planning and to say, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're not normally making money now. Normally students are at home. And so we've had some of that time to plan where I think you guys have had to kind of be running um, as you're going, like cleaning as you're going. As and I say, so, changing the tire as the car's moving. That's right. Yeah, that's exactly right. So I think it's helpful for us to hear, hey, there comes a point where it gets super hard. You have to be kind to yourself as you've been. And, and, and if you're not, like right now, if you don't have, and I'd like to hear uh, uh, Sherry's thoughts, if you don't have your stuff together now, whatever stuff you do put together, you're probably going to miss the mark. And I hate to say it, unless you're a crammer where you've been preparing, say, I'm going to come out with this last minute because I really want to understand every single thing. And you've been planning and you just haven't put it out there yet. That's different. But if you're just like going, oh, my God, that's right. Kids are coming back. We're, like, there's there's no way you're going to put a plan together that's going to work. Yeah, I agree. Sherry, do you have something you want to add to that? Well, I would say, too, I mean, these are extremely complex organizations. So even if they have a plan for academics, you know, I know the housing people have been spent a lot of the summer trying to figure out how are they going to open the halls and do it smartly and safely. But, I, you know, all the different moving parts have to be. I, I sat on a webinar for rec services. How are we going to do rec services safely? Um, you know, and rec services could be anything from intramural sports, outdoors, great. But inside working out, let alone online. So there's so many moving parts on these organizations that all have to have a plan. And I think and I think, what I'm seeing in the hotel business and even in just businesses that I go to, yeah. the plan has got to be in place where the plan can't be broken. You cannot leave the plan to people's interpretation. Right. You can't. And that's where I think people are, <clears throat> some people are making mistakes. So if you're saying that you're going to have, I don't know, um, tennis, just say tennis, right? Okay, so to make sure the seats that you put for fans or you put for the other people are waiting to play tennis, make sure those seats don't move. Like, I would literally bolt those seats in. Yeah. Like, like, that's the kind of thinking you've got to do. So they can't pull the seat next to them. That's you right. know, it, it's, it's like if somebody doesn't have a mask and you know they're going into class, have a box that you can't break into, but you can pull a mask out of. Yeah. Like, that's the kind of... To me, if I was running a hotel right now, like my OCD, and I suffer from that and several other issues, but it would be, seriously, it would be, it would be on high alert. Yeah. Like I literally, when I take over hotels, I don't sleep or eat for six, probably six weeks 
um, barely eat and barely sleep. And until I get that stuff locked down, and once it's locked down, and once I think about every little thing that can go wrong, I don't work weekends and, I, and I'm home by six o'clock. Yeah, and that's, that's what to me this is. Well, okay, so if we're playing tennis, then kids sit here and they sit here and nobody should be next to each other. Well, guess what? They're going to move the chair. Right. If, if it's not fail safe, they will figure out a way for your plan to fail, right? A hundred percent. I think that is critical. Yeah, I totally agree. Look a little, that. like to me, like <clears throat> I like when people look at me and go, this guy's out of his mind because I know I'm going to be the one that's got it right because I am, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to manage human behavior. Right. See, we have people going to 7-Eleven and taking guns and shooting people for wearing a mask. I mean, like, like this is crazy. Yeah. So you've got to really kind of do everything bulletproof, literally, so it doesn't get, you know, so people don't take advantage of it. People yeah. are going to break the rules, especially an 18, 19-year-old kid that is, is he's my, I give an example, my daughter, we bring her home to her, to her house in, in uh, at, at the college and literally her house is it looks like it's on campus but it's not it's a private house and my wife's uh, wife said hey make sure when you're in the house don't get too, too close to your friends you know you guys can hang out whatever if you're gonna hug them or whatever just put your mask on make sure you all have masks on my daughter runs up the stairs and jumps in everybody's arms and I, you're like, I we talked about this no but i expected that you know my wife said my wife was like oh my god i was like babe did you not expect that? Right. That was going to happen. Right. She can't come home unless she gets tested. She already said, she goes, I'm going to get tested before I come home. It's, it's, it's like, you've got to be realistic. Yeah. I think that that's right. And, and you've said before, and I really like this idea of how do we anticipate the places where it can be broken and make sure that that's not where we end up. Right. How do we, how do we make it fail safe? I really like that. Hey, I've been reading a book that I think you'll be familiar with. Do you know this book? Uh, yeah, a little bit. I I had him on my show, Horse Shelter. Yeah, I know yeah. it was wonderful. Um, so I want to talk about finding our students because I really loved this book so far. Um, he talks about well. First, Anthony, will you give us an introduction to who this person? Is? Horse Schulte is the was the co chairman of Rich Carlton. Rich Carlton basically um, the the owners of the company wanted a whole different level years ago. So they brought in a guy named Horst Schulze that worked in the hotel business for a long time. And he said, I will only come aboard if excellence means something to you. If we do something different and we do it at a whole different level and we respect and appreciate our employees as well as our vendors, as well as our guests, the vendors and the employees come first. And it's ladies and gentlemen, serving ladies and gentlemen, this man invented five-star service in America. Um, if you go to Europe, if you, I, I stayed actually at a five-star hotel, it was the first five-star hotel um, in, um, uh, in uh, Italy, which actually the Rich Brothers actually created back in the early 1900s. And um, so in Europe, they kind of got it. In America, we really didn't get it. So he went to all the fancy schools. He worked his butt off since he's like eight years old. I think yeah. he made his mother like bring him to get a busboy job when he was eight. And what is great about horse shows is I've been around a lot of people that understand excellence. What I love about this man is he understands that his socks that no one's ever going to see have got to be perfect. They got to be clean. They've got to be, they've got to look right. Like even if no one ever sees them. Yeah. And that to me, I learned that early in my career too. Like I worked for a company that if you went in the basement, you can eat off the floor in the basement in the boiler room. Literally, literally can eat off the floor in the boiler room. Like that wow. to me is how you, that's why Rich Carlton became Rich Carlton. You know, and then you can say, well, I we went to Marriott and it changed a little bit. And it did change a little bit. I don't care what anybody says. Rich Carlton right. is still a great brand, but it's changed um, because you don't have Horst Schultze and pe like-minded people. I'm not saying some people aren't, but he is one of a kind, period, end of story. Yeah. And if you, if you want to understand excellence in any part of your life, you need to read that book. Um, I love that he starts with this idea of you need to, you're not, we're not telling everybody how we're going to run it. We're not telling like, and then you come and then you do this. We need to give people an opportunity to tell us 
to help us understand what they need and what their expectations are. Um, you know what my favorite, my favorite uh, question in an um, interview is when I'm interviewing somebody? What's something that pisses you off? That's my Ooh. first, one of my first questions. I want to know that up front. What pisses you off? And when they <laughs> tell me, like they're lying because they're trying to be nice. I'm like, listen, I'm not hiring you until you really give me something that I can work with. And they tell me, I so I'll, then I know not to do that because I don't want to piss you off. And, and to me, we don't ask questions. And early on in my career, I didn't ask questions. And now all the questions, like if you ask students and you ask teachers, they have all the answers. Right. Thank you. Right. So he tells the story that I really love, which is he starts asking people, what do you want from a hotel? And they tell him, I want it to feel like home, which he's like, I'm sorry, what does that mean? Right. Because like, I mean, he actually says in the book, like, I can't go around and decorate my hotel to feel like you're home. So we've got to dig more because people don't know how to articulate what they actually are saying. And then he digs some more and he says, I really love this. So he says, um, <clears throat> They want to feel something from their subconscious memory, what they used to feel in their mother's house, right? Which is like, I don't know, I didn't have clean clothes. And then I came and all my clothes were clean and there were cookies baking and they're like, you don't have to worry. You don't have to take care of anything. You just exist and people make the world nice for you. Basically. And that's why I like clean hotels because my, my, I didn't know, honestly, until I had my own home, I didn't know what dust was. And people laugh at me when I say that. They literally laugh at me like you just did and say, oh, that's so funny. I swear to God with my hand to God, I didn't know what dust looked like. My like, house what is was, this fine mist all over everything? What? My house, literally, we didn't have it. So I didn't know what it was. Like, literally, I'm not kidding. It's not a joke. Wow. I remember the first time in my living room and I saw dust collecting. I was like, what's that? Like, oh my God, that's dust. I got to clean the dust. Like, <laughs> like, like it was insane that how clean my house was. So the reason I love five-star hotels and I love clean hotels is because it reminds me of my home. Like that's you give, so I go to a five-star hotel and it smells like Clorox and I'm like, I'm, I'm like overdosing. I'm so happy. They like have a candle. That's the Anthony candle. It smells when like I first candy. got married, my wife goes, I don't like to smell Clorox. I was like, oh, my life sucks. <laughs> it's like, I literally- I'm like just now discovering this. Yeah, well, I, I wouldn't have married you. <laughs> This is a piece, Sherry, I want you to talk a little bit as you're talking about surveys, but I think it's a really great example of how we ask students what they need. So Sherry and I worked on a, um, a survey in March to try to figure out what was going on with students. And they were saying things, we asked them, what do you miss most about school, right? And they are like the college feeling, which, okay, that's really hard to know what that is. They would say things like, um, the lectures and not being on campus and I need to find a quiet place and I and I miss the social interactions. Okay, so I'm trying to understand what you're actually telling me is the value of college, right? Also, everything's within two minutes and I miss the library and the study hall and and so the way that you make sense of what a student is saying or what somebody is saying about a hotel is you just listen to hundreds of them over and over and over and over and over and then you try to find these themes where what a student is actually saying is i miss the environment and the physical um space to be successful academically right we just listened to those hundreds of students and said primarily it's these things that we need and we wouldn't have known that no there's no admissions counselors who before march were selling we have the physical space for you to be academically successful. No one was saying that. They were walking them around, but they didn't understand that value of students need to be on campus because the resources are there, the space is there. It helps them order their life. So I love that example of like, how do we, how do we ask them? And then how do we dig down and figure out what it really means in the same way, feeling like I'm at home means something different than what we, we actually assume. I was going to say, Rachel, even digging down to what it's not, because there were students that would talk about um, that, that I missed the library, but it wasn't the library. It was that that's a place where I can buckle down and study and focus compared to at home where I have constant interruptions. People think I'm playing games. I can't isolate. I can't like suddenly now you get a real sense of 
of what they need to succeed. That's exactly it. Yeah, that was so, really so many of our schools, I think 67% of our schools did a survey in the spring semester. Um, 33% did not. And then I'm also really curious about the summer as well. If you guys did ask questions of your um, students to try to understand what was going on, how, how we can find them. So Sherry, can you talk for just a minute about um, some surveys? You guys know that every time we spend time with Anthony, I am trying to find tools and language so that you can use them to be successful. Um, Sherry has just so much experience with this idea of surveys and asking students about what's going on. And so, and it's a super affordable survey. I really love that also because I think like when she told me how much, how much is it, Sherry? It's it like, depends on the size of campus. Okay. So yeah. When she told me though, I was like, this is a, this if you're not going to a conference, you can, you can use this survey and it's going to give you a lot of insight. So will you talk to us about it for just a minute? Yeah. Um, well, and I, I think the key is, is well, a couple things. Number one, we've been doing this work for what, 20 some years, something like I have been doing this work. And, um, we all know students have so many different challenges and, and complexity. And we used to have a great big survey we did. Uh, we did it for more than a decade, hundred some odd questions, all the, all the things every researcher was dying to have, right? Um, but I think the key has always been, how do we get this so that it makes a difference? I don't know about you. I don't wanna, I don't know, study students just so it makes a journal article. That's just like, that's nice, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't matter. So we've been studying all these different things and I kept hoping, honestly, that we could do it almost without a survey. So finances, what are their finances? Does that matter? What's their transition to college? Can we find out something about their high school experience? Can we find out something about their academic preparation and then figure out who's gonna be at risk? Um, and I think one of the big lessons that we've learned through the years is that finances are critically important, but how a student perceives them, which is actually why um, your original quote, Rachel, kind of struck me because you said, you know, or, and you even made the comment, experiences provide meaning. It's the meaning students make. If they're worried about finances, that's going to impact what happens to them yeah. or what they decide to do. Um, if they're worried about their academic pre preparation, um, we've even done research on self-efficacy. If they think they're competent, they're more likely to push through. Intuitively, we all know it. Um, social and personal adjustment. We've been working on studying things like homesickness for decades. And if you ask students if they're homesick, I don't know, 50, 60% on many campuses will say they miss people. I miss people these days. But, um, <laughs> but there are better ways to ask those questions so that you can find out which students are really struggling with these issues. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we've been working on is trying to come up with um, using all of this data that we have, how do we ask these questions in a really simple, easy way um, so that we can make a difference with the students. And so what we've done, um, we did those COVID surveys in the spring. We actually piloted one of our first really short surveys last fall before COVID hit. Um, and it was the student success survey or a version of it. This fall, what we did was put together a whole series of them. What we're um, looking at, and I think what's a reality of this fall, is so many of our usual mechanisms to find out how students are doing, the inter informal interactions may not be there, the facial expressions, we might not be able to see them. So we put together a series of these little surveys at key times about key issues super small, mobile friendly. As you said, we priced them so that they can fit. Um, one of the other lovely things that I'm excited about, uh, Rachel, for your clients is they can pull it right into Pharos and use them. Yeah. Um, so the readiness survey, for instance, it's before the term. Is Does the student have the technology they need? And can we kind of help them if they don't? But, you know, trying to find out what they're going to need. Are they feeling comfortable about the safety and security of COVID kinds of things? Um, are they feeling motivated? I don't know about you, motivation's a huge issue for many people. Yeah. I think Anthony, you said, right now everybody's brains are a little fluxed, uh, so are students, so where are they sitting? It, 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 it's true, you've got to force, yeah. I'm talking from personal experience. Yeah. I've never had to force myself to stay motivated. I think my whole life, I've never had to. And I wouldn't say I had to force myself to be motivated, but I had to force myself not to give in to the news media, not to give in to what's happening, not to give in to the negativity around me, 
not to give into my friend who have we have this thread that I read and I just lose my mind and I, I deleted it. I've decided that like I'm just not doing it. I'm just not going there. I'm staying here, and I'm not going there. And it, it, it was it was um I had to be forceful with myself. So and what's crazy about that is you have years and years of experience of being a whole person, right? And you're still, in a place, you're still in a place where you're like, hey, I have to force myself. Then we're talking about 18, 19, 20. Well, that's what scared me. I mean, that's what scared me. I was trying funny. That's what scared me. It's like, wait, hold a second. I talk about this every day. I'm writing a book about it. It's, it's like, what? Like, wait, whoa, what, 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 what are they talking about here? I'm like literally talking to myself going, no, no, no. Right. If, if I was, so imagine 18, 19, 20. I mean, in 1920, I was, I was on the brink of, 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 you know, wanting to not live anymore. I couldn't mm-hmm. imagine yeah. having to deal with that anxiety and then say, oh, you have to deal with COVID. Oh, and by the way, when you do get out of college, good luck and God bless you trying to find a job. That's right. Yeah. So, so it is we've got to we've got to yeah. be kind. We just got to be kind to everybody. We got to be kind yeah. to each other. Well, and I think like when we were putting together the plan for all of this stuff, it's about is there a way to systematically check in with a whole group of students and find out who might need some support? Yes. And and when are the key times? I'll tell you the times we picked and the reason we picked them before the term starts. One of those um, are, are our thoughts about before the term is a lot of folks are looking at enrollment numbers they don't know if they can trust. Are the deposits right? Are the numbers right? Um, and I keep thinking too, okay, the students said they come back. Are they waffling or are they serious? Let's find out and let's see if we can help. Because yeah. if we wait till the third week census date, it may be too late. Yeah. Um, so we figured before the term, let's check in with students, see where they are, see if we can get them set up. Um, week three, we found through you know a decade or more, week three, they've got a little bit of experience on campus. They can tell you, are they homesick? How's the roommate? You know, those kinds of key issues. So where are they at week three? But they haven't dug a hole we can't get them out of. Rachel, you use the term, what, success debt that I love. Have they acquired very much success debt by week three? Probably not. We probably can help them. Um, we picked week eight, sort of a typical term. Uh, that's right around midterms. If they got their first bad grades, you probably want to check in with how they're doing. Um, many of our A students don't get A's their first semester of, right. of college. So that's a good time to check in. And then after the term is over. Um, and so I think these key checkpoints will be really lovely. Um, this is just some example kinds of things that we're asking about. Um, should look really familiar. If a student's thinking about leaving, huge red flag that they're likely to leave. Yeah. Um, Because it's not common, so it's one we look at. I told you motivation, academic behaviors. Many students know they're not doing the things that they think they should do. So we ask about that. Homesickness, sense of belonging. Do they feel like they fit or belong? That's the one I worry about because that can be some of our best students leaving for yeah. reasons that we could help with, right? That's right? And that to me is the most important, not only in college and business and life, yeah. like that sense of belonging. And, and like we as at least, you know, whether it be in high school or in college, like we immediately find our group or yes. we don't. Right. And like very, I, I, just personal experience, very often like those people that are on the outside stay on the outside. Right. So, so, so what I always try to do in my hotels is I try to bring them on the inside as quickly as possible because they're not going to come in because once, once those clicks all happen, now that wall is pretty strong. So if you don't push them into that sense of belonging by asking them questions and making them feel comfortable, it, it's, it's, it's a long road for those, those kids. Yeah, that's right. I think the research really backs you up, Anthony. Um, that? that three week, the research backs you up for college students. At three weeks, if they don't have a sense of belonging, that's a big red flag. And we need to help them at that point in time and make a difference. Um, Huge predictor of not only even just whether they come back second semester, uh, they come back second year. So, And we have a problem because you have freshmen coming that have to find a sense of belonging in the middle of a mess. 
And you have sophomores coming back who spent one semester and then were sent home at spring break. And so they have to find a, a sense of belonging in the middle of a, a mess, right? So both of those populations, I think if we're talking about hidden at risk, those would both be ones that we want. When you're telling them not to good neighbor each other. Right. <laughs> exactly. Do you have a sense of belonging when you have to stay six feet apart and keep your mask up so you don't know what anyone looks like? You know, somebody, a, a fan of mine saw me today. I was going, I was jumped into the grocery store and he put his hand out to shake my hand and I shook his hand. I was like, okay, I guess we're going to shake hands now. And I went, I went in my car and I, I washed my hands, whatever. Yep. Kind of like, I, like two weeks ago that happened and I was pissed off. Now I was just like, I kind of like it. I kind of yeah. like that I'm shaking the guy's hand. And then I, again, but I, you know, I burned my hands. With clean. precaution. Yeah. 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 Um, Sherry, do you want to just talk for about two seconds about how this works? Yeah. Well, I think one of the things that we were um, hyper aware of is the fact that it should be super, super simple. People need to focus on safety and security, not how to set up a survey. So it's a five minute setup, five mouse clicks when Mandy does a demo. Uh, there's a URL, send it out however your students are used to getting messages. So if it's in the LMS, send it there. If it's through texts or email, send it there. However you need we didn't want to worry about that either. And we have data or we can pull it into Ferris or whatever you need. So yeah, um, I, we don't want people make, spending time on this part of it. We how, want do you make them, time. how do you make them take the survey? It depends on the campus. I've seen everything from, um, you know, campuses sending out small things, a pencil, like which, you know, is amazing to uh, larger big things. I will say these short, short surveys are way easier. If you get it on your phone and you can fill it out right there, it's, it's, it's much simpler to do. And, and then- I wonder about the messaging too, so that if you say this, like, because what, what we're finding both from our clients and also from students is people are hungry for help. They are, they want to tell you what's going on because they feel lost and they feel overwhelmed. And so I wonder if the messaging is like, hey, this is how we can get you the resources that you need. Um, if that even we're checking on you, we care about you, we want to know what's going on with you. And this is what we plan to do with it. Right. If, if they think it's just going to go into a black box and they'll never hear from anybody again, that's very different than we're checking on you because we want to know and we're going to follow up with people. It was fascinating if I read what you put up there before correctly that 71% of colleges did not check on their students during the summer. Is that correct? That's right. So 71% of students did not do a survey of their students during the summer, which that is blows interesting. Me, that blows me away. Yeah. Well, funny. and do you remember, Rachel, we did some of these little tiny ones over the summer. And I yeah. know, like, um, and I'll just throw their name out because they did good stuff, is uh, University of Tennessee Martin. He did one of those, and he called people after yeah. that That's to right. check with people. And some of those students were so excited that somebody called them. To check on them. Right. We okay. have a lot of schools that did that, that said, hey, we're going to check in and it's mm -hmm. not going to be an email, how are you? It's going to be a, I want to talk to you on the phone so that how you know that you? We're, we're committed to you. Yeah, um, makes a huge difference. Um, I did on the next slide, Rachel, just in case it's helpful, yeah. give oh. a couple of resources or maybe you put it at the end. I moved it. I, okay. I will put okay. it at the end. Rachel chatted out the link but Perfect. I will also show the slide with all of those resources. Um, and if you want to see some of the results to some of that data, just connect with me on LinkedIn. Like the, the study we did together, I'm sure you put it in your stuff too, but yeah. it's neat yeah. stuff. Great. Yeah. Um, okay, so I have a great story that I want to tell, unless, unless Anthony, you know the story and you want to tell it. So this is out of the book um, that we were talking about, This Excellence Wins. Mm -hmm. um, it's about um, the this hotel that opened in... I think it was Colorado and they had their number one complaint was morning room service. Do you know this story? Um, I vaguely, okay. I've, read, I've read the book, but I can't remember. So. Yeah. So the reason I want to tell this story is because we do have a new normal and we are going to have new processes and we are going to have new data and new problems we have to solve. And my encouragement is that we don't just say, okay, now we have this information and we have these new processes. And if it doesn't work, I mean, there's nothing to be done because it's a wreck anyway, okay? So um, in the book, Schultz talks about he opened a Colorado uh, hotel and their number one complaint was morning breakfast uh, room service was late. It would never get there in time. 
So people would be really mad and they wouldn't get their breakfast in the morning and then they would have to throw away the breakfast at the end because the person was gone by the time it got there. So he said, I need you to solve this problem. And for five years, the problem did not get solved. And he said, that was my lack of leadership. I didn't really understand how to help people solve the problem. I just was mad that it was a problem. So after five years, he said, I want the person who takes the order. I want the person who cooks the order. I want the person who sets the tray. And I want the bus boy who brings it up to the room. I want them all in a room and I want to understand what's happening, yeah. right? So he, they're talking and the process is great. The, the guy writes it down right. He gets it to the chef. The chef cooks it quickly. The tray's all set up. They give it to the bus boy. He goes to the elevator and he waits for 20 minutes for the service elevator right? And so they come back and they're like, it's the elevator's fault. We don't know. We don't, we don't really understand what's happening. And, and Chelsea's like, no. So then he hires a person to sit in the elevator from like 3 a.m. until 10. And he's like, you tell me everything that happens with this elevator. I think that's actually after they got the Otis elevator guy to come out and be like, there's nothing wrong with your elevator, <laughs> right? So this guy sits in the elevator and starting at like six in the morning, which is when people need their breakfast, He's writing and the, what is it? The, the guy who gives the supplies for the housekeeping. Right. Rides the house, elevator up house. to the floor. Yeah, house, houseman. And puts a bucket to keep the door open and goes and gets sheets, right? And then, and then rides up to the next floor. He does this for like 22 floors. So the elevator is never coming, right? And so the guy goes back to Schulte and he's like, hey, the problem is the elevator doesn't come because the, the houseman is... So they, Schulte goes to the houseman. He's like, why are you doing this? And they said, well, the laundry doesn't give us enough sheets. So he goes to the laundry man and he says, why are you not giving them enough sheets? And the laundry man said, well, Schulte, when you opened this hotel five years ago, we didn't have enough money. And so you only bought two setups of sheets instead oh, of three. Right. I remember. And, and so I did not have enough. So we have to juggle all the way up and down in order to, to fix this. So he was like, okay, first of all, it's my fault. Who would have thought that <laughs> it's because I didn't give you the money that you needed. And then he bought an extra setup of sheets for all of them. And the complaints went down 80% and just and by buying an extra That's why I love him and his style. Because when you read that book, that's what he does. I always say, I've said it since day one in my career. I, and I've said it on this, uh, on this panel. I do not fix problems. Right. I solve them before they happen. And what he did was, that is what I do when I run a hotel. But why, but why? One of my things that scares everybody in the hotel is like, when there's a problem, who did it? And like, no, 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 don't worry, you fixed it. No. It's like, I don't care about that. I'm gonna give that person a hug if he tells me the truth. I don't care that they did it. I wanna know who did it so I can ask them, why did you open up that door? Right. Well, because I don't have enough sheets, okay. Who's in charge of the sheets? Let's go. And that's how you run a business or a campus or how you get ready for COVID bringing your students back. And I'll tell you right now, the Hilton Hotel in New York City, um, they have 1,200 rooms. How many um, breakfast orders do you think they have at 9 o'clock on a Sunday or even 7 o'clock on a Monday? Hundreds. Yeah. Hundreds. So how many waiters do you need? And they're all making union wages. So... It got so complicated with the elevator and just a just high demand that you can't get room service at the Hilton in New York City anymore. They couldn't solve that problem wow. because, because it was so such a big problem. They can't make more elevator banks. But they, but they realized after years and years of dealing with all the complaints and dealing with all the overages in, in that room service. The reason, you know, when you go to New York City and a bottle of water costs you $1.2 billion is because the labor to bring it up to your room cost $1.1 billion. Right. <laughs> well, I love the chasing down of, and the, the wisdom to say, we can't do that well. We cannot solve that problem. We cannot do that well. So we're done. Like, yeah, so we're the not gonna do that went, The union went like, what? Like, yeah, we can't <laughs> solve it. We gotta shut it down. And we don't put anybody at work, but we can't fix it. And yeah. that, that's also important to know. There's some things that, that these schools are gonna, run into they cannot fix That's right. so so they've got to either shut it down they say rec services of course you're not you don't want to shut down rec services but you might have to shut down so listen right now what's happening with college sports yeah. right 
Yep, that's exactly. Well, or you shut down a facility and you move this online and you do that, like you figure right. out ways and that's what they're working on, figuring out ways. So I have, um, I like to finish our time together with quick hits for you guys because I want you to be able to go out and do stuff. So please, as you're thinking about identifying your students, remember you have a whole group of pre-identified students. If you did a survey, you know who those students are, you need to connect with them. Also, we're finding that there are certain majors that are, are having a harder time moving to online. So yeah. if you are doing online classes, things like deciding majors or pre-nursing or some of those hard sciences, that's a, that's a group that is going to have more difficulty. Um, you need to be doing surveys. You need to be asking students what their experience is, how you can help them. Remember that you have in um, Ferris 360, you have referrals self-referrals so that a student can say, hey, I need some help. Can you please, this is what's going on with me. And then also community referrals. Do you need to be talking about, please tell us if you know that a student is struggling. And then one more thing that I think would be helpful is on your campus, you need to tag on to whatever service you're providing, whether it's financial aid or it's advising or it's in the res life hall. <clears throat> you should give everybody who engages with the student this list of questions and tell them to pick one. And that they're not just trying to solve the financial aid problem, but they're also checking in with students to say, hey, how's this semester going? How has it been with your time management? How's your family doing? Pick an appropriate question and check in with your students to make that less transactional. And if they tell you, I'm not doing great, I'm feeling overwhelmed, that's when you make a referral so that we can get the right resources to those students to be able to do um, a good job. So I would give check-in questions to everybody on your campus and say, you need to have these in front of you so that you can be doing the work to make sure that you uh, know what's happening. And what, you know what I've learned with my own kids during this whole thing is um, you may not have the answer and, and, and that's okay. And just listening sometimes is enough. I know with my own kids, I'm like, again, as a dad, I fix everything. It's what I do. I'm going to fix it. I'm fixing the world. That's it. I'm done. It's, yeah. By the time you wake up in the morning, it's all fixed. And when I can't fix things, it just, it drives me into, it, to, to, it's a bad place. <laughs> and, but, but I've learned that I can't fix everything. And, you know, so when you're doing, you're opening up your school again and, and you're trying to fix everything for everyone, you can't. Yeah, that's right. And we're all, I mean, we are all trying to figure it out, right? We're just trying to do the best that we can. So I have a bunch of resources for you guys. Again, we'll give this to you so you don't have to take um, pictures feverishly. Here's all of the resources about the survey. So if you need to find out what's going on with your students, these are the resources for you. We also have um, some videos. I told you last time that we were doing videos for students. So I have the first one done, which is a time management um, video. And so Anthony, I need to send this to you so that you can give it to your daughters. You, we were talking about that last time. Um, but this is one that you can send out to all of your students to say, here's what everybody's going through as we're trying to figure out time management. Please watch this. It will really um, make a difference for them. That's a resource that we've, we've done for you. We have a bunch of COVID tools that we've created. We talked to you about the um, thermal scanner, which is still in my office. And I scan my face every morning to make sure that I'm not ill. Um, and then uh, also a survey just to kind of hear about what is going on. Anthony, I have a question for you. Somebody was asking about if we have to have a plan for everything, what do we do about students who are in a apartment off campus or basically an environment where we can't control what's happening? Do you have a good answer for that? Um, again, information, you know, what, the, what can the student do to protect themselves and to ensure that they're safe? And those are the people to me, like if I did a survey, I would take those people and take them, on, uh, 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 you know, see what they say on the survey, but then put them in a different column and say, these kids are taking this class by themselves in a studio. And I would literally have that uh, um, list on my desk every day. And I would suspense myself if, to call them once a week, once a month, once a day, whatever I thought that they needed. And I would make them tied to me somehow. I love that. Like that so, to me, it would be like, like I, I have to take those on as my children. That's right. I love that because that is saying, I mean, we're talking about hitting that risk, right? 90% of our population is going to do what they need to. They're in it. They're in the community. They're ready. And then you have this other population that's like, I'm not doing it. I'm not going to do any of the stuff that you want me to. That, those are the students that need to have a mom or a dad, right, 
a, a surrogate mom or dad to be like, hey, how's it going? You know, what's happening with you? Let's keep our community safe. I think that's a great suggestion. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's no, listen, there's no simple way to make a connection. The only way to make a connection is make a connection. Right. And you have to, I'm not good at that. Like I am not good at breaking down those barriers. And I know most people say, oh, of course you are. I'm not. I'm not, like if somebody's in pain, my first reaction is to leave them alone. My first reaction is not to inquire. My first reaction isn't to jump over that wall. Yeah. Unless it's my own family or good friends. I am, I am okay, I'll leave you alone. Well, they don't want to be left alone. I don't right. think anybody wants to be left alone right now. You know, they don't want you to pry on them. You, you know, they don't want to be inconvenienced. But no one, like, how are you feeling now takes a whole different meaning. Yeah, right. And, hey, I'm fine. You can't accept that now. And so I would force myself if I was in that position to not fall into what I usually fall into. It's like, okay. And, and I also check it off my head. Not my problem anymore. Right. It's, we talk about it in terms of like intrusive, right? Like I don't want to be intrusive. I don't, we have to be intrusive now with our students. We have to be intrusive because they need it. Um, and also it's for the good of the community. So I think that that's a great suggestion to just say like, we're going to, we're going to talk about how at risk you are. And then that population, we need to be super intrusive um, with them. You got, my summary, you guys, is just we, we, there are so many things we could be pouring our energy into. And student life people are um, people who love students and they are committed and they want to work hard and they want it to be a success. And I think the way that we don't burn out is we pour ourselves into the right things, the things that matter for students, the things that they've said they've needed, um, the things that we can recognize that we can help them fix. And we, don't, and we just get laser focused on those things. Mm -hmm. And we don't waste our energy in a bunch of other stuff that maybe it doesn't matter to students. They don't care about it. It's not going to impact them. Uh, I know students that were anticipating being a club or being on a sporting or on a team and they're not going to be. Those students, are, I, I would just straight up say they're, they're the most at risk because I know my, my daughter's going to be you know, working out for volleyball and they're going to have a way of doing it. But if that went away, oh my God, I would literally sit outside my daughter's dorm room going, are you okay? Because like those students, they've worked their whole life to go to school, to go to college and also to play a sport. Those, yeah. those kids are, are going to have a hard time. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, well, you guys, thank you so much. I always really enjoy spending time with both of you and it's nice to be able to spend time with you together. Yeah. Um, fun. We, yeah. We just, we just have to ask our students what's happening and, and dig in and figure out what's going on. Um, to all of our attendees, uh, you will get, um, all of those resources. If you have other questions or there are ways that we can help you, please let us know. And we'll send you a copy of this. Um, Anthony, I know that you have a super busy day today. You had your 11 o'clock and you're in the middle of a conference. Is that true? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a long story. Oh, dear. Oh, it's just, it's I'm bouncing back and forth. Okay, Sherry, I'm going to ask a question. Uh, sure. Ticket number 1250, go. Any number? 13. Ah, I was so close. What is, I what knew it would be a lower number. I said, <laughs> she's going to pick a lower number. I picked nine. Oh. <laughs> Listen, we're fifty percent for the day, so I think that's awesome. This is. But I knew it'd be a low number, which is interesting. I don't know why I would know it would be a lower number than a higher number. That is interesting. But, uh, yeah, we're we're. It's funny uh, talking about doing things we haven't done before. AHOA, which is the Amer the Asian American Hotel Organization of something or other, and they're the largest community uh, of hotel owners, and basically it's the Indian community. And over 50% of hotels in America are owned by the Indian community. Hmm. And they, they, when they first came to this country and everybody was kind of discriminating against them and no one was giving them time of day, they're like, okay, there's power in numbers. So they forced themselves together. And now they have this unbelievable organization, which is the biggest and best in our, our, in our organization. Wow. And um, now if they say, hey, Mr. Marriott, we need you to come talk to us. Mr. Marriott, if they say, hey, Mr. Mokchuri, come talk, like we all come running because <laughs> they're very, they're a very powerful coalition. And, and that's what I'm doing. They asked me to do a speech to Congress for them. So I'm doing, I did that yesterday. But um, so they're doing their convention, which they postponed and they postponed it to now until August, but then Florida screwed up and now they can't have it in Florida. So they're having the first real hotel uh, hospitality convention, large convention um, online. And uh, we'll see how that goes. So yeah. I'm popping in and out all day long. Yeah. Yeah. It, it seemed like you're doing it. And tomorrow, Facebook Live. 
if you don't know about well, the Wednesday, crazy Thursday. Thursday? Thursday. I don't even know what today. Today's Tuesday, so it's sorry, right. Thursday. Right. Yeah, three o'clock. We break down your favorite hotel, the Anish Hotel. Yeah. yeah. I'll I mean, keep an eye out. Yeah. Right. Thank and, you guys. Uh, okay, well, thank you. It was always a pleasure. Thanks, Anthony. Nice we'll talk to you later. You. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Bye.